But there's a guy named Hill here. <laughs> we know that's Daniel Harvey Hill. But at least some of the Federals at the time think that's Ambrose Powell Hill with another corps of the Army of Northern Virginia. There are Confederate and Federal, Confederate prisoners and Federals who swear that they saw Joe Johnson with the entire Army of Mississippi in Dalton <laughs> on September 16th. Wow. Yeah. That, that is based on the fact that Johnston has sent troops to Bragg's army. Mm. So they are Johnston's men. They're from Mississippi. Um, and um, as Bragg retreated south, he had left Bushrod Johnson's brigade on the railroad to screen the movement south down the railroad. Well, Johnson and Johnston sound <laughs> fairly alike. Um, and a whole bunch of guys are from Mississippi where Joe Johnston is known to have been. So, <laughs> the logical misinterpretation is Joe Johnston is here. And in actuality, Joe Johnston has left Mississippi and moved east. He is in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, now, I don't know that any uh, federal learned um, that because I'm not sure that, um, that Bragg ever even realized Johnston had come that far east. But um, Johnston had come east because he's given all his troops to Braxton Bragg and he's hardly getting any word from Bragg about what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, so he's trying to find out, um, you know, if, if I'm now threatening Mississippi, um, am I likely to get these guys back that I've just sent to Bragg? So, in theory, or, or uh, in a worst case, the Federals could be outnumbered two to one. Mm. We know that that's not true, but they didn't. Mm. And they, they had uh, pretty good reason to believe that they had a disadvantage in numbers, even if we know it wasn't nearly as, as great as they feared. All of which means that uh, George Thomas is reluctant to thin his lines, to extend his position. Uh, and so instead, Thomas asks for a division that he's missed for a couple of days, James Negley's second division of the 14th Corps. Uh, Thomas is trying to get all of his corps back together. Uh, since he departed uh, on the night march on the on September 18th, uh, his divisions have not fought uh, all as a single entity. He, that doesn't mean he doesn't command a good chunk of the army. In addition to the three divisions of the 14th Corps that are with him, he has one each from the other two corps. So he has five of the of the ten infantry divisions in the Army of the Cumberland. Rosecrans was fine with this. Rosecrans trust Thomas implicitly, maybe uh, maybe cedes a little too much authority to Thomas at times, but in any case, he's totally comfortable with George Thomas uh, commanding uh, this wing, this half of the army. But Thomas also wants Negley, and uh, and so that's that's going to set the stage and put the pressure on uh, on on Thomas uh, or really on Rosecrans. Uh, to feed Thomas more troops. Rosecrans has already been up here and agreed that Thomas needs more men. Now we need to know where they're going to come from. There are, uh, there are something like 13 different couriers that travel down the Lafayette Road or the Dry Valley or, or the um, uh, Glen Kelly Road uh, uh, to, to urge Negley and or to urge Negley forward, either directly to Negley or to General Rosecrans. Uh, and that happens somewhere between 7 and 8 o'clock in the morning. So Rosecrans... They need Gordon Granger to continue to hold the Rossville Gap. Is that what it was? Yes. They're afraid that if Granger moves south and exposes the gap, uh, an, uh, another entire corps of those 120,000 Confederates are going to pour through the gap and head straight for Chattanooga. Mm. And, and largely because we can't drive that corridor today, um, it, it's more difficult for us to understand the importance of that old federal road that went from Rossville Gap past um, Lake Winnipesoka, Lakeview Drive um, uh, there, 
and then at, um, at, at Spring Creek, uh, where today Lakeview Drive starts to turn southeast, um, the old Federal Road just continued straight um, across those fields over there to where Prater Road touches Max Smith Road, crosses the creek onto the drag strip. Um, you know, with none of us have ever been able to, um, to drive that, um, that road. That road's gone by 1900. And so we, we can't uh, really appreciate that the same way, but that was the main road into Chattanooga. So Granger is also sitting astride that road. Um, and of course it appears on the maps but you know, I, I think largely it, it's kind of been forgotten in the histories um, in the, the 20th century and, and to today um, because um, none of us have been able to experience that road. Um, we can't move in that corridor. So. Minty is guarding wagons somewhere. Where? Well, on the morning of the 20th, he actually um, is, is sent up there to join um, Granger. Okay. And Granger then deploys him um, to his left or north um, to, um, to, to begin guarding some of the other roads over Missionary Ridge further to the north. Okay. Um, so so uh, Mindy goes up towards Mission Mills, Bird's Mill, um, and, um, uh, and then when Granger marches south, Minty comes down and takes up the position astride the Federal Road. And he'll have he'll have cavalry pickets all the way out as far as, as Red House Bridge on, on the Federal Road. They'll they'll actually fight. Yeah, there'll be a little skirmishing. fight. Yeah, there'll be a skirmish there. But by the the Confederates, because this battle's now going on, um, uh, Forrest has even thinned out his force um, up there. Scott's Brigade is the only thing that is up there. There'll be a pretty bloody little fight with, um, with um, for Scott's Brigade, but um, there isn't enough Confederate force to actually exploit that. And that's why Granger then feels comfortable in coming south. Yeah, later in the day, Granger will, will have determined that that threat isn't there, but at 6 o'clock or 6.30 in the morning, that threat is, is uh, still very significant and they're very concerned about it. As a matter of fact, Rosecrans has direct wire communications with Granger thanks to the field telegraph. Uh, and uh, during that evening conference, uh, I guess in between ballots by McCook, uh, they, uh, 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 Rosecrans will telegraph Granger a couple times. How is the terrain? Can we defend Roscoe Gap? Uh, and uh, and Granger will answer that, uh, that he's got a, a good position. So how does this affect poor poor Dodge Joseph B. Dodge and his uh, and his remnant of a brigade? He's only got about what seven hundred people. About that. He's he, he's just found his men again. They've just put themselves in, in what order they can. Uh, after uh, after the, the fighting of the night before, uh, Thomas has has gotten approval uh, to to get Negley. Negley's going to come up uh, and come very soon. Rosecrans has agreed he needs more men. Rosecrans uh, uh, at that uh, at that meeting up there at the McDonald House at 6:35 in the morning. Rosecrans writes an order to McCook. To, uh, to pull Negley out of line, replace him with some of McCook's troops, and start Negley on his way north. That doesn't happen nearly as quickly as Thomas hopes it should because, uh, well, by and large, because there's simply not enough troops in McCook's uh, wing anymore uh, to, uh, to really uh, take, uh, just pull Negley's division out of line, march it north, and replace it with existing troops. Uh, uh, and, and so, there is some confusion. Now there's another point uh, that's always confused me about this. Uh, Rosecrans has specifically created, uh, the, uh, or pulls the 21st Corps back, two divisions of the 21st Corps, uh, behind the line and use them to create a reserve. Two divisions, uh, uh, Tom Wood and uh, Van Cleef. Van Cleef. Yes, Van and Van Cleef. I heard this little voice in my head. Sorry. <laughs> That's how I... Uh, 
embarrassment. Um, <laughs> Wood, uh, Wood's division has only two brigades, though he's not had. Certainly, uh, one of his brigades has suffered uh, a, a considerable loss uh, down in Vineyard Field. Harker's brigade has had tremendous adventures, but their casualties have not actually been that high. Uh, and then um, uh, Van Cleve's division uh, has has actually been handled pretty roughly uh, in Brotherton Field. Uh, uh, we talked about him at pretty considerable length when we were talking about uh, A.P. Stewart and Brown and uh, and all of uh, all of the fighting of yesterday. So neither of these divisions is very strong. Uh, we have two brigades and then three more brigades, so for a total of five brigades. But each have suffered relatively significant losses. But still, they're in reserve. They don't occupy a space in line. Uh, why not send one of those divisions up here? instead of sending, uh, pulling Negley out of line at Brotherton Field, marching him north. Conducting a relief in place. <coughs> yes. Which is time consuming. For whatever reason, initially Rosecrans doesn't want to do that. He sends orders to McCook instead to replace Negley. Uh, when when uh, McCook doesn't have sufficient troops to replace Negley immediately and is trying to organize a, a, a probably a, is going to try and organize Sheridan's division to come in. Um, instead, Rosecrans gets impatient. Uh, he's ridden back down to that area uh, and, uh, and ultimately will make the decision to uh, just have Tom Wood's division go into Brotherton Field and replace Nick. Uh, there's, uh, again, we're, we're touching on other programs that we could do, we could do a couple of hours on what's Negley doing and what's happening. Uh, needless to say, Negley starts to pull out. Rosecrans reprimands him. And so Negley moves his uh, front two brigades in. And just like everybody else, he's got two brigades online and one in reserve. John Beatty's brigade of Negley's division is the reserve brigade. And so they start up this road first. And they, uh, about 7, 7.30, what time does the tablet say for him? I think it actually says 8. eight. Yeah. yeah. But that's when he's in position. So he comes in, uh, he comes into Kelly Field. Uh, he gets orders from Thomas to extend the, the line. Uh, he knows he doesn't have enough people to extend the line to reach Bridge Road. So initially, he takes up a position astride the Lafayette Road right at the north end of the field, facing into McDonald Field which is not what Thomas wants. Uh, and, and Thomas uh, will actually move him forward, uh, reorient him so he's facing east, uh, and stretch his brigade out to cover a division's worth of frontage. So, so we now have this very fragile line to the north. And uh, at about 8 o'clock, or about seven o'clock. I think this one says seven. Says um, eight. Uh, looking for more troops, Dodge's brigade is pulled out of line and sent north to extend uh, uh, to extend the line. Well, what they we'll talk about how they extend the line up there when we get there. But basically, they're they're pulled out to to support the left uh, and. They, they view this as a temporary move. Dodge certainly does. Um, and they have a, a very uh, unusual arrangement. In his report, Colonel Buckner says that you, meaning Joseph Dodge, uh, it was understood that you would take, uh, would provide the overall supervision while I commanded the line. In other words, the three regiments, 29th, 30th Indiana, and 79th Illinois, are going to go up there under Alan Buckner's command, not Dodge's command. Dodge is going to stay here with the division, uh, apparently because they believe it's only a temporary measure until uh, other reinforcements arrive, uh, arguably uh, James Negley's division. I'm sure there's 
stuff that I've left out. Yeah. Um, by your direction, took command of the line, you supervising the general movement. That's what Buckner writes in his report about that um, strange command um, arrangement. Um, the, um, so the movement of, um, of Dodge is going to thin the, the line out here a little bit, reduce the, uh, the depth some, but still out there in the field you've got, um, got Villick's brigade. Um, and um, uh, Villick um, uh, says, on the 20th September, my brigade in reserve, I took position in rendezvous formation behind a slope in an open field in the rear of the breastworks. From here, I could support the front and be prepared for the flanks and rear. Um, after a short stay in this position at 9 a.m., I was ordered forward um, and directed by General Johnson to engage. Um, but you know, he is, he's still in reserve at that moment until the Confederate attack um, is going to uh, begin. And um, he clearly understands his role as a, um, uh, as a reserve. Um, his rendezvous formation reference um, is to, um, uh, to having the, uh, the units formed in, um, in column of division, um, pairs of companies, um, so that, that facilitates movements. Um, and I don't think, I don't think he or anybody says whether they were formed, how, how the um, uh, column of, um, or the column of division was formed, whether it was left in front or right in front or um, um, on the center, but, um, but being in that formation, so there are basically four blocks of troops back there, um, which could facilitate rapid movement in, uh, in any direction. Um, and he's got, and behind him is his battery, good speed, battery A, first Ohio light and artillery. The other thing worth noting is that the field is, is there are several artillery batteries in the field. The good speed, uh, the monument we just passed. Uh, uh, the 20th Ohio. 20th Ohio under Grosskopf. Uh, is out here, uh, Battery M of the Force U.S. Uh, I'm not sure where Battery H is. Are they also out here? Um, yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know exactly where they are at this yeah. moment. So, so um, they're going to be here later. Uh, but so, in addition to the infantry that you see uh, or, or that you can imagine, uh, there are these multiple artillery batteries, and uh, and perhaps most distinctively, rows and rows of maps from all of those troops that have uh, congregated here overnight, dropped their packs and are now ready to fight. And supposedly, one or two soldiers from each one of the regiments that have dropped their knapsacks out here, sitting on their regimental pile of knapsacks, guarding them. Um, Always important, all the yeah. other, uh, you know, the all of the thieves in an army are not on the other side. <laughs> First ones you have to be worried about are your own comrades. So those couple of soldiers who were left with each regiment's pile of knapsacks are probably surreptitiously going through everybody's knapsack. Um, the, um, uh, but some of them have also apparently um, absconded, um, and because um, uh, there'll be a lot of looting of, um, of knapsacks. So, um, somewhere just up here, um, in addition to, um, or the artillery vehicles out here include the battery wagon and traveling forge of, um, of the 4th Indiana Battery, which is um, in uh, Starkweather's brigade of Baird's division just up here. They had had to do repair work on um, some of their carriages overnight to, um, to be able to get five of their guns on the front line on the, um, on the 20th. The clearing of the wood, this would be light. Right. In, in this area, we've used mechanical means to thin the understory and to attack the um, Chinese privet. <laughs> They're now attacking. Yeah. 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 There we go. And to attack the Chinese privet. Um, and so right now, this area, uh, particularly this time of the year with the leaves off, this has got roughly the density of... Um, 
uh, of the, the woods in 1863. So. Yes, sir. What do you do? You know anything about <clears throat> Captain Grosskopf? We know a little. Um, he uh, he is uh, recently given command uh, of the Ohio Battery. Uh, he replaces a captain, and I forget that officer's name, who uh, is uh, uh, who apparently was incompetent. Uh, he he takes over the battery and finds out that it's uh, uh, it's deficient in drill and discipline. Um, he. Uh, one of uh, one of the battery members says that uh, things were so bad that, that uh, Captain Groskopf basically had to do every job himself, uh, uh, from gunner on up to count, uh, battery commander. I was wondering if he was one of those recently migrated Germans that came out of. I don't know if he's a, a revolutionary emigre or not. Um, I haven't been able to find a, a lot on him. That means big head. Yes. Big head. Big head, fat head, you know. <laughs> Square head. <laughs> the, um, they, the commander ranger that Buckler talked about, what, how did Dodd, did he, did he comment on that? Did Dodd comment on that? Uh, no. Uh, actually, in, uh, in that memoir I mentioned from the uh, 1870s, uh, 1875 Northern Indiana, I think is when it, the first part of it appears, Dodge does not uh, elaborate on that command situation and uh, as a matter of fact if you were to just read it straight through you would be under the impression that Dodge was with the brigade up there it's only based on uh, what's in the official report of Buckner and also on Buckner's memoir which was published uh, many years later uh, um, that we get, to, that we understand exactly what's happening between Dodge and Buck. This is a really strange arrangement. It is. Unless Dodge, you know, if he'd been lost all night, maybe he wasn't in shape to, to take command. Uh, there, there's some possibility that he might not have been physically up to act, uh, actually commanding the brigade. Or, or mentally uh, yeah. to yeah. commanding and the brigade. Kind of yeah, with the over, yeah. Now they want to say anything. Yeah, being, being rattled by the experience of the evening before, and um, that's all. That's all possible. Although you know, he, he acquits himself um, uh, well at Stones River nine months earlier, so uh, you know, he's in a terrible situation there because it's Johnson's division and they're they're going to be um, uh, driven uh, badly. But um, maybe he just needed to catch up on some sleep. Yeah, he, he may just be rattled from the experience of the evening before. Well, combat stress uh, produces weird reactions. And, and even the best men will eventually 